Hello and welcome back to Teens on Topic. I'm your host, Cedric Hughes, and today I'm joined by two special guests. Hi, I'm Zoe Poppingay. I'm Ben Skinner. Today, we'll be discussing the impacts of surveillance on our nation. But first, let's take a look towards the views of the Davis community. I think it's kind of hard to say in a lot of scenarios because on one hand it kind of feels like a violation of privacy to have mass surveillance constantly going and have every one of my actions or at least most of them be monitored but on the other hand it's also really good for catching criminals and for uh, stopping crime to be able to survey basically everything and see what's going on um, I think that it kind of comes down to what you consider mass surveillance and if you are like taping people in their homes I think that public spaces I think it's understandable for surveillance to be had, but if by mass surveillance you mean that like all homes are monitored and especially personal devices is a big thing because a lot of people say and believe and it's all but confirmed at this point um, that a lot of personal devices monitor your data and your personal choices and a lot of details about your personal life. I think that that's probably overstepping it and I think that that kind of goes into um, a lot of uh, violations of your um, of the like um, the amendments of the Constitution. I think specifically um, I think it's Fourth Amendment is a big one that's violated by that. Um, but I think that public surveillance is probably does more good than harm, but I think that it's a lot harder to say for personal stuff. Hi, I'm Joseph Hendricks, and unfortunately I will not be in this episode on, of Teens on Topic, but I will be answering the question. Um, I think that mass surveillance is does a lot of harm, and depending on what who is in charge of this mass surveillance, um, they can influence how bad and how good it is. For example, I think that Facebook and companies like Apple are treating this, treating mass surveillance very poorly. I think that they should not be using it for, um, I don't think you should have Face ID for your iPhone. I think you should just be able to put in a password. And I feel like Listening in on people's conversations for advertising is also very, very uh, dystopian-esque. And I think that overall, it's not a very good thing. So that's my opinion. I think it's 50-50. There's pros and cons to it. I feel that um, to fight terrorism excuse me, and crime, it's, also, it's always nice to have that safety net on the streets. But also, I think it can create um, probably some kind of hysteria if people see the wrong thing or think they see the thing. Or if you um, or the wrong person could get, you know, in trouble for it. So it goes both ways, in my opinion. I would say, moving forward for me, that I would probably lean towards um, having uh, them watching over us. But it, it, you know, eventually it's no one, it's a big brother issue, and no one wants that either. I guess it just depends on what what level of surveillance it is. Uh, you have technology, cameras, stuff like that, and so I would say. Certain levels are okay, but others I would be against it. Um, just kind of the government all up in our the government all up in our business, kind of knowing where we're going at all times. That's why I'm going to move to the mountains. Um, what levels of mass surveillance are helpful, and then what might be like harmful, like you said? I guess the helpful ones would be those that. Um, maybe law enforcement would use kind of for facial recognition looking for criminals stuff like that um, and then the ones that would hinder I'd say would be those like used for technology purposes just for advertising and trying to you know there's no privacy looking where you're looking as far as online and things like that, Does that, is that okay. good? yeah thank you well we've seen a lot of great opinions from members of the Davis community so, Ben and Zoe, we saw a lot of discussion surrounding what's more important for our country. Is it going to be security or is it going to be privacy? And how do we attain a mixture of both? So, where do you guys fall on this issue, Zoe? Um, I know the, <coughs> the number one benefit mentioned with security was that it could stop crimes and excuse me, it could stop crimes and um, there's a lot of criminal identification that can happen because of it. But I feel like with um, 
even with this new cyber technology of like identification and constant security, it would make things a lot safer, but then people would still find ways to work around it. People have always found w ways to work around the new innovations that is security. And, then, re and um, then they're also given an outlet, an even bigger outlet, to further enhance, evolve their, um, to further evolve in terms of crime um, with security. I mean, such a big violation of privacy. Like I, I'm, uh, just just the very thought of constant surveillance makes me feel extremely uncomfortable. And you don't have to be a guilty person to be uncomfortable with just being constantly watched. And um, I know um, we always talk about. Um, uh, current cancel culture and um, having your digital image being forever existing, um, which is causing a lot of problems in terms of not allowing very much character growth. Because even if you change as a person from what is previously recorded, I, this isn't specifically security, just you overall as a person. If some um, you doing something being recorded, no matter how much you've changed, it's still there and it's still like a physical quantification of who you once were. And so, I feel like that that forever frozen in time thing is a really scary thing that just doesn't I, it just doesn't sit well with me. Sure, uh, Ben, what do you think? I think it's important to make a distinction between things done by private companies and things done by the government. So, like, are are you specifically talking ab about which one of those two things here? Uh, well, we can, we can talk about both. So maybe um, do you want to start with the government? Sure, sure. Yeah. So I I think that's something that is really not even necessarily that helpful. I think. The level of data you would need to collect to actually be able to like prevent terrorism or whatever fr from happening is just simply unrealistic. Like, there's no amount of data you can collect, like no um, amount of pictures you can take that allow you to predict like exactly when a person, like, or, or like who is a terrorist, right? So I I think it's important to understand that like mass surveillance isn't necessarily something where we choose to do, to do that and we automatically see benefits, right? But I, I think that is really pretty, um, pretty inappropriate for that to be something that the government's doing, um, partly for privacy violations. But I, I mean, like I just said, I, I think it's not even that helpful. So when you weigh the pros versus cons, it's really not something that we need to be doing. And I think there are major threats that can, can happen, like there's kind of more small scale things like you know security cameras in public areas, but I think there's things too like collecting people's DNA, like that kind of thing. I, I mean, I guess that's not really surveillance, but like the whole idea of like collecting mass amounts of information on, on people to me that's far more troubling than simply like we're going to put up a security camera at the farmers market or whatever. Sure, and, and so I, th I think you both kind of touched on the negatives that surveillance can bring, both in kind of the feeling uh, of not being comfortable with it, and also the ineffectiveness of it mm -hmm. that we've seen. So when we look at surveillance on a national scale um, that's done in America, a lot of people will first point to the Patriot Act that was signed yeah. in 2001 after the 9-11 attacks and the anthrax attacks. So this had a sunset period in 2005, but it was extended um, all the way out to 2015, extended again to 2019, um, and the current administration um, signed and has extended it again. So we see that surveillance has continued. However, in 2015, uh, provisions were put in to stop the NSA from wiretapping phones and individual houses without warrants. So we did see a lot of the, the big detriments from coming from the Patriot Act of people feeling uncomfortable with that, uh, at least as far as we know, go away. Um, so we are told now that we don't have wiretaps in our homes, uh, in our homes or in our phones. So does that, knowing that, that maybe the government isn't as involved in surveillance on you personally, does that dissuade that feeling uh, of being uncomfortable or is the possibility that they could be watching because they have been watching, is that still there? Um, <clears throat> I think the, yeah, it's just the uncertainty of like how much you trust the government, I guess that's what it comes down to. Um, I guess, um, I feel like even in terms, as, as you said before, surveillance can also extend to um, tracking, tracking your uh, internet history research, which is, as uh, Joseph mentioned, advertisements used to cater to your being. I mean, there's also like that kind of tracking as well, which is what makes me more, um, which is what makes me more concerned because there's really no like 
l um, laws that, there's really no laws that protect that yet. Um, of course, um, listening to, like, uh, as you said before, wiretapping, that's been said and handled, but um, in terms of tracking internet history, um, but yeah, as you said, more than just what you say and, um, yeah, more than just what you say and um, what you see is being tracked. So that's that's also what scares me too. Sure. Uh, now, Ben, you talked about there being a difference between government surveillance, so like those signed in by the Patriot Act mm -hmm. and by the United States Freedom Act. Um, there's also corporate uh, yeah. corporate surveillance. So every time you make transactions and are active on platforms such as Facebook, they are watching that. So yeah. they have the right as a corporation to keep that data. So, you know, all those terms and conditions that, you know, no one ever reads in there, you're all you're signing away your right to privacy. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we as a society should be worried about? Do you think that the amount that corporations can look at our data and can analyze that data, is that something that we should be worried about? Or is it uh, a necessary evil, so to speak? Yeah as a cost of using these platforms? I think there's two parts to it. So I, I personally think that as long as the companies are being honest about what they're doing, it's on the consumer to choose whether or not they want to use that product. Mm -hmm. To me, it's not rational for people to say, I think my iPhone's spying on me, but I'm still gonna buy the iPhone 10 or mm -hmm. I, iPhone X or whatever. It's like, if you have an issue, then you can simply choose to not buy that product, and then if people start buying rival products which are not doing that, then problem solved. I, I think the free market kind of works out there. But I think the problem you encounter is when companies are lying about what they're doing. For instance, the whole Facebook thing where Mark Zuckerberg or his company was selling data to Cambridge Analytica and, and then basically saying he wasn't doing that at first. I think that's extremely problematic because then even though people think that might not be happening, it actually is happening, in which case people are not capable of making that choice to switch to a different product. So I personally think that, uh, uh, that as long as companies are just being honest about what's happening, they have a right to do whatever they want with your data. And I think a lot of consumers would end up choosing to buy alternative products. And I think they would totally have the right to, to do that. Yeah. But that's just a thing that consumers have to choose, knowing all the risks. Yeah. And uh, now, I just momentarily, I'd like to transition back to talking about government surveillance, because I, I think you said something interesting earlier, Ben. And, and that was around the point of, we don't know how effective mm -hmm. um, exactly um, the Patriot Act was, or how effective the surveillance that the United States is carrying out was. Because while we can point to maybe crimes or terrorist attacks that happen, it's a lot harder for us to point towards ones that didn't happen because of right, surveillance, right, right? Right. So, and we've seen this for you know all throughout history, right? In World War II, um, the United States interned Japanese people on a massive level, mm -hmm. citing national security, just as we um, did wiretaps and, and home taps, citing national security after the 2001 attacks. Now, in World War II, there wasn't a single incidence of Japanese terrorism in America. Now, many people point to this as saying that um, the internment was going far, far too far, uh, much overboard, um, a position that personally I, I take. I say, you know, it was too much. Right, um, I agree, yeah. But then, maybe others would argue that we don't know how many terrorist attacks that could have prevented. So, is there a world in, in which our surveillance, you know, we, we can't tell just how much safer we are because of surveillance, because we're not seeing the attacks that could have happened. I think that depends on the way in which it's being done. Like you brought up the ex example of, of like Japanese internment. There's really not too much logic to the I idea that simply because a person is of Japanese origin, they have a high probability of wanting to like blow up an American ship or spy for Japan or whatever. Like that's just not really something that makes a whole lot of logical sense. So I think. In a case like that, it, it's really not justified. Now, if we're doing surveillance on people who type in to Google how to commit a terrorist a attack, and then types in like when are there no police officers at X location, like like that, at that point you have a certain degree of probable cause that makes me like more comfortable with surveillance happening. So to me, it really depends on how much reason there is to believe that the person they're investigating is actually a likely threat to. United States as a whole, because this blanket like 
idea of just we're going to wire, wire to everybody's phones or, or like we can do it for like basically whatever reason we want, that doesn't make sense because most people are not going to be trying to commit terrorist attacks. Sure. Well, I, I think we've covered a, a lot of really interesting ground today on the, the trade-off that we as a society are forced to make between privacy and security. You know, you can never have completely one or the other. And I think that, you know, with this issue, as in many other issues, we face trade-offs. That's j it's a given, and it's something that we have to deal with. And it's going to be a question that doesn't end with just the continuation um, of the, the surveillance in 2015 and 2019, but it's going to be something that our nation continues to deal with. And I, I think that that's, you know, like how we end so many segments on this show, it's something that is a question for future legislators and future policymakers to, uh, to ask themselves. So what trade-offs is our nation going to make in the future? Thank you. I've been your host, Cedric Hughes, and this has been Teens on Topic.